Namaste. My name is Preeti Upala, and I am a global thought leader and a multimedia personality. Welcome to my podcast, The Preeti Experience. Join me as I explore some of the most fascinating and crucial issues that affect our world today. I take a unique global perspective on these issues and the very foundation of my insights is humanity and spirituality. I'm Preeti Upala and welcome, welcome to the Preeti, Preeti Experience. Experience. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 118 of the Ron and Brian podcast. I'm Ron, as always, joined by former advisory board member of the We Build the Wall uh, fundraising campaign. Brian, Brian, uh, nice to see uh, no indictments, uh, no arrests for you as of yet. Glad no. to be uh, here with us tonight. I think it is important for people to know that... The project that I helped found, We Fund the Wall, um, we were, how do I say this, um, victims of uh, some, uh, how do I, uh, I don't want to pass the buck. I don't want to make it seem like I'm not taking responsibility for my actions or the actions of my partners. But um, we just took some uh, aggressive accounting steps. Um, it's all going to come out in, uh, in, in, in the court case. Uh, absolutely nothing to fear. I sleep easier tonight knowing that the truth will come out and that the wall will be built. All right. Well, let's get things rolling here tonight uh, with Drink of the Week. Drink of the Week. Nastrovia. Salud. Drink of the Week. Sponsor. Who's? Drink of the week. Drink of the Brian, week. Brian, I already got a week. sneak peek, but why don't you tell uh, our listeners out there what you're drinking tonight? Broken goblet. I knocked out a crowler. Well, I will be knocking out a crowler in the next hour, slowly as my words start to slur and my thoughts start to um, disintegrate even faster. This week, we're working on the watermelon lime Rattler. That's a good one. Only uh, what a three point two percent, so it's a nice, uh, it's a nice warm up pitch, if you will. Why are you starting off already denigrating the the, the ABV on my beer? No, I'm not. I'm saying, you know, seeing as how you get some days, uh, maybe going lower uh, earlier um, might be a better way to go. Ron, when my beer goes low, I go high. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so I, uh, in keeping with uh, the theme from last week, I picked up another Black is Beautiful beer. Uh, this one from our good friends at Evil Genius Brewery down in Philadelphia on Front Street. Um, they are uh, they are donating to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund with the sales of their four packs of Black is Beautiful. Again, an Imperial Stout. Again, ten percent. Nice, uh, nice look to it. I have not, uh, I have not tried this one yet, but let's see here. So, so basically, you mocked my three point mm. two because you knew you were coming in at a ten percent. Is that really that? That's what I'm picking up is, is going on here. Mm. Hold on. Look mm. at that! Look at that! That that ten percent alcohol just rolling around your taste buds. So good, so very good. I, I can't deny it. Just so, so very tasty. Pisses me off. Ah, it's what not you fair. Do? What are you going to do? All right. Well, uh, anything else I, to say about drinks? I mean. I'm feeling like we need to have a wine uh, uh, a week. A wine week. Well, we talked about that. And we were supposed to have uh, the guy that did the uh, dating app on tonight. And we were going to do yeah. a little red wine tonight. And he, uh, he postponed. Um, so we have a different <laughs> guest tonight. Just like a true online dating app, you, 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 you get your expectations up. And then, and then he ghosts us. And then they just crashed. All this right. is the last time that a man ghosts me on an <laughs> online dating app. I have had enough. I, you know what? I'm going to just, I'm going to start switch. I'm going to switch my preferences to women. All right. Good call. In the meantime, let's uh, this. get into some racism. We in racism. 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 Uh, Brian, we were doing so well. Now back to two full pages oh, of racism this fuck. week. I know, right? Why? 
So, uh, and again, lots on the West Coast. We're going out to L.A. Uh, an Asian American woman was verbally attacked by a man in a Mexican restaurant after she declined his invitation to join him for lunch. H.D. Lee filmed the man's reaction as he used racist and sexist slurs towards her and posted it on her Instagram page. Uh, since her video went viral, at least one additional woman has come forward claiming that the same man verbally abused her at a bus stop in L.A. last July. The LAPD initially did not file a report for Ms. Lee's incident, labeling it a disruption of the peace, but have now turned it over to their hate crimes unit to investigate. Flipping all the way to the other coast, Valley Stream, New York. A uh, white couple has been arrested for allegedly harassing their black neighbor by repeatedly shooting pellets across her yard and leaving feces on her lawn. John McEnany and Mindy Karanick are accused of carrying out the attacks against neighbor Jennifer McLegan since she moved into the neighborhood in October 2017. Uh, the DA is not prosecuting this as a hate crime charge, instead charging McEnany with criminal mischief and harassment and Kanarick with criminal tampering. No, this right. actually feels like a pretty racist uh, incident. It does. It does. Uh, let's see. Who else. But not a hate crime. Not a, Only hate because... Crime. It, the issue here is that for for you to have a hate crime on Long Island, it literally needs to be a 10. <laughs> needs to be over the top. Yes. All right. Uh, Bill Baptist, an independent photographer who had been shooting Houston Rockets games for a number of years, was fired by the NBA after posting an offensive meme about Senator Kamala Harris on his Facebook page. He posted a fake logo for the Biden-Harris campaign that said Joe and the Ho which was seen by former WNBA star Cheryl Swoops, who brought it to the attention of the NBA. Uh, Baptist uh, had been inside of the NBA Orlando bubble before being relieved of his services. When asked, he said that the post didn't reflect who he is as a person. He was just sharing something he saw online. Uh, coming here to Pennsylvania, a white judge is facing six counts of judicial misconduct for racial statements he made in his courtroom. A formal complaint was filed against Allegheny County Judge Mark Tranquilly, alleging that he has engaged in racist behavior against black jurors and defendants since at least 2015. Tranquilly was placed on administrative leave back in February after allegedly referring to a black juror in a head wrap as, quote, Aunt Jemima. He went on to speculate that a juror had a baby daddy that was, quote, probably slinging heroin. The complaint also details a 2015 trial where he spoke to a black couple and allegedly, quote, affected an accent and dialect described as Ebonics. He is quoted as saying, when I say communication, I don't mean, and then the bitch done this, and then the bitch done that. He also allegedly told a female defendant that she'd laid down with dogs to have her two children uh, in a 2018 sentencing hearing. And this guy is a judge? He is a judge. And the, and the crazy thing is, is he, uh, with, this, uh, with this complaint, the worst thing that can happen is he can get suspended without pay. He can't actually lose his job unless uh, the state decides to, to, to go after him. Fucking hell. Uh, Stuart D. Baker, who performs under the name Unknown Henson and uh, was a voice on the Adult Swim animated series Squidbillies, was fired from the cartoon after posting comments about Dolly Parton and Black Lives Matter on social media. After Parton voiced her support for Black Lives Matter, he referred to her as a freak-titted old Southern bimbo and a slut in one post, and in another said, have fun forsaking your own race, culture, and heritage. Baker had posted an apology, which he took down after being fired and replaced with a post lamenting the loss of his career. Poor guy. So he apologized while his job was still on the line, but when he yeah. lost the job, he withdrew the apology. He went uh, He went scorched earth. All right, Arnold, Missouri. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Department is searching, searching for a white man who called a black woman the N-word multiple times before pistol whipping and then shooting her. April what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes. Run that by me again? Uh, he uh, pistol whipped and then shot her. So April uh. Brown had been visiting a uh, friend when the incident occurred. She had gotten into an argument with one of her friend's roommates and was preparing to leave when Adam Lee Pillow, a good name for you, approached her and verbally assaulted her before physically assaulting her and shooting her in the left side of the face. Uh, Pillow spent time in prison previously after pleading guilty to possessing the chemicals needed to make crystal meth. 
Shocker. Uh, you don't say. Of course, we have to have a Florida story. This one in East Naples. A man captured on a viral video yelling racial slurs at a woman was arrested after leading police on a high-speed chase. Uh, the video had been shared to Twitter on August 13th and has almost 4 million views. Jeffrey Adam Rouse was arrested Saturday after speeding through an intersection at over 100 miles an hour. He was identified as being the individual in the August 13th video, as well as a separate video from August 6th, where he was recorded shouting racial slurs at an elderly black man. He was also photographed defacing political signs on August 8th and physically threatened the person that took that photo. He has been charged with fleeing and eluding, assault, and two counts of criminal mischief, and the sheriff's office is requesting a hate crime enhancement from the state attorney's office. Brian, you can have a comment. He, at least he's consistent. I mean, yes, a lot of hatred, but you have to understand this man is, you know, he, he, we're all going through a pandemic. We're all going through quarantine, lockdown, trauma. Um, this is how this man is go, going about his business. Listen, he's, he's on brand for the, uh, for the Florida ra- racist we have down there. The worst uh, part is that he probably doesn't even make like top 20 all time Florida racists this yeah. year. He, he doesn't even make the worst this week which is saying Oh, fucking hell. Uh, let's see. San Francisco, California, Daly City Police are investigating an incident where a white woman yelled racist and derogatory slurs towards two Latino men. She was initially uh, yelling at one man walking his dog when Stanley Gonzalez witnessed it and intervened. Uh, she then followed him to his car, verbally abusing him while he videoed her. Uh, police have identified that woman and filed a report, but have not released her identity. So that was okay. all of our new uh, racist stories this week. Uh, but we got a twofer. Racism Rewind. In Racism Rewind, uh, Barry Pressgraves, mayor of Lurie, Virginia, finally issued an apology for a Facebook post he had made referring to Kamala Harris as Aunt Jemima after Joe Biden had announced her as his VP pick a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we'd reported on that. He has apologized. Still many people calling for him to resign, which he has so far refused to do. Uh, he had previously announced that he would not be running for reelection. Um, and then this is going back actually a couple of years. You might remember in November of 2018, two members of the Minneapolis Police Department had decorated a Christmas tree in the fourth district with uh, racially insensitive ornaments, such as a pack of menthol cigarettes, a can of malt liquor, and a cup from a fried chicken restaurant. Uh, Officers Mark Bonsack and Brandy Steberg have been placed on administrative leave after the incident and were both eventually fired last August. Bonsack appealed his firing, and this week an arbitrator overturned that decision, and Bonsack will instead serve a 320-hour suspension. Ah. The mayor and police chief are now asking the state legislature to pass reforms that would reduce the power of arbitrators and prevent them from overturning firing decisions made by the police chief. Okay. Brian, thoughts on that? You're, you're a man who doesn't like big government. Thoughts on uh, the mayor and the police chief trying to restrict uh, the rules of, arbitra- of arbitrators? Talk to me. I, I, I think that uh, you know, we, we do need to uh, honor the ability for an employer to fire uh, an employee. Uh, these guys deserve to be fired. They deserve to be fired four years ago before this event happened. Um, once it happened, they should have been fired immediately. The fact that we're still talking about it a year and a half later is just fucking sad. Well, I mean, it took, what, uh, nine months for the process to run through to fire them. And then, I, you know, the, I guess the bigger question is he has to serve a 320 hour suspension. Will that be considered time served or will he have to um, will he have to actually serve the I mean, I guess it's two months, really, when it comes down to it. I don't know. I just want somebody to walk up to him and say, you got served. <laughs> Why would they say that? I fucking I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it, it's, it's, it gets pretty bad. I understand. 
I understand. Um, so uh, please, we, tell, please tell me we're done with the racism. We are done with racism for this week. Um, it'll be back next week. It always is each and every week, unfortunately. Uh, but now it is time to bring on our guest for the week. Uh, our guest this week is Preeti Upala. Uh, she is a former investment banker turned thought leader, media personality, and Hollywood entrepreneur. Uh, her weekly spiritual radio show, The Eternal Hour, can be heard on iHeartRadio. And she also has a popular YouTube channel called The Preeti Experience. She has been to almost 100 countries and is currently developing a spiritually focused international travel series. Her book, titled New Feminism is scheduled to be published later this year. Please help me welcome Preeti. Preeti, thank you for joining us here on the Ron and Brian podcast. Namaste, uh, Ron, and namaste, Brian, and namaste to your wonderful audience. I am honored to be a part of this show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's so important to have these conversations, and I'm glad that you're able to have honest conversations about these very, very intense, challenging uh, times that we live in, you know, so so thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Sure, great. Of course. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely challenging times. Um, I, I guess to start, maybe, you know, probably the biggest thing in the news, obviously, last night uh, mm -hmm. was Senator uh, Kamala Harris accepting uh, the vice presidential nomination, uh, first uh, African-American woman, first Indian-American woman uh, to be a vice presidential candidate for uh, a major political party. Um, personally, I thought it was a great choice. Brian, I think you're, you're a fan as well. Um, Absolutely. But I do what, what I like in addition to the pick is, uh, you know, the the inspiration it gives i think to 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 people out there who don't see themselves represented in those positions uh as much as they should um was was great as well uh Preeti, what what are your thoughts okay this is a it's a, it's a very charged um a topic uh, it, it shouldn't be but it is so you know the um you brought up great point but the question is does it represent because just because somebody uh happens to have an Indian sounding name or dark skin doesn't mean that that person actually represents the community at large and the community's needs and wants. And I think this is a very important point to make because we have seen through time, you know, many uh, minorities, uh, for example, that were, have been elected to office and in politics and so on. And the community did not feel that they uh, sort of voice, that they were a voice for them. Uh, in fact, sometimes it can be antagonistic where these people are actually going against what the community at large actually cares about. So I think with this particular uh, pick, unfortunately, the Indian American community is very divided. Hmm. It's look, all, all, all groups are divided, but I think somehow uh, suddenly India is again uh, at the center of um, the elections in, in a way that it, it, it probably shouldn't because we have our own politics um, at home. So, so you know, it, it's interesting to note that um, there are plenty of Indian Americans, and I work with, you know, people in, in our community, grassroots, political parties, religious groups, and so on. Um, I think at the end of the day, we want, uh, you know, a U.S. foreign policy and the U.S.'s policy towards India to be fair. And that hasn't always been the case. So the question is, is it going to be uh, better if with her? And the, I mean, there, there are plenty who would say no because of the, I think the general stance that the DNC has taken um, uh, as far as some of the Indian government's actions are concerned, as far as India is concerned and so on. Uh, you know, they, I, I think in many cases, uh, a lot of these are internal matters in a foreign country that have nothing to do with a political party here in, in the U.S. because an Indian party wouldn't bring up U.S. issues over there and nor should it be this uh, in the U.S. either. So I don't know how much you follow uh, what's been going on in India or, you know, sort of whatever uh, the little that's been reported in the news is often mainstream very media. Little. It's very misrepresented. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so... Um, one of the uh, the largest political activities, I think, probably of the 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 probably the next ten years will be. Uh, it happened last year in August, and it was the abrogation of 
Article 370, and this is to do with Kashmir. And it was a big deal for India to finally pass this and get rid of this very discriminatory uh, piece of article in the Indian constitution. And it was uh, overwhelmingly supported by uh, all parties, uh, by the country at large. Certainly the diaspora was very, very excited. People were celebrating. Finally, after 70 years, we get to uh, to do this and integrate the state of Kashmir, which exceeded into India, properly within the Union of India, right? Because this article was an obstruction to that. And yet, I think the DNC has been has taken a very antagonistic take on this, and that has obviously um, hurt, I think, the sentiments of the community. And they uh, were they actually felt that. It, uh, the, the DNC wasn't, it was completely ignoring their point of view and narrative, and it, they took it personally as, as an attack, you know, and they, trust me, people are still talking about it. And they are, I can name you three other things that happened like that, because I think the DNC of late has taken a very antagonistic uh, stance towards India and Indian government uh, because of the advisors that they have, because of the people that they surround themselves with. I think they get... Uh, I don't know who briefed them on foreign policy, but they get very, very poor briefing because some of their statements don't make sense. They don't add up to uh, the facts, you know. So from that perspective, when this whole news erupted, I think a lot of people in the community were like, whatever. Like, I mean, does that make a difference to us? Unless she's going to uh, be pro-India in a way and push for greater ties between India and the US, how does it affect us? Because uh, unfortunately for us, it's not just about being American. We do care a lot about our country and also US foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis India, considering they have strange uh, foreign policy in that neighborhood. Uh, in, in, you know, if, if you've done any research or if you know about what's going on, versus, you know, with subcontinent politics, it's extremely intense. So. Um, you know, so these are questions that uh, are highly debated in the community. It is divided, you know, and but, I have to say that a lot of people in the diaspora, you may speak to them, they may be thrilled, but uh, the younger generation, the uh, kids, uh, a lot of these people are very uh, clueless about Indian history and Indian politics and in their own culture in many ways. So asking them is like asking another American. They don't know much. They think it's a great thing. That they don't know all this backstory, the nuances that a uh, analyst like myself would know, for example, or some think tank person, or someone who is 70 years old, who's witnessed the whole U.S. India history for the last 50 years. They will tell you if this is good or not. You know, so it's. I think it's a very nuanced topic, much more I'm nuanced than you may expect. I'm. Sh I'm sure that. Um, if I can ask. How is the current U.S. administration viewed by the Indian American community? Very interesting. I, I thought you were going to ask, how is this administration viewed back home? Because I think that's another answer altogether. So again, this administration, uh, it's divided. You know, they uh, so traditionally, Indian Americans have always voted Democrat. 80% vote Democrat, they, they did in 2016, and I think several um, elections before that. It's always been very heavy uh, because they resonate with the uh, values espoused, uh, supposedly espoused by, because it doesn't always happen, but the values espoused by the DNC, like the freedom, independence, you know, liberalism, free speech, free, uh, religious freedoms, secularism, all those wonderful qualities that we love. So it's always been that way. But um, I think of late that that has changed. I think there's a, uh, because of some of these uh, stances taken by the DNC and some of the people in the DNC itself that are seem to be very anti-India. Um, I think the community, obviously, they're not stupid. They, they know that and they feel ignored. They feel uh, hurt. So you have a lot of people that um, are moving right and are moving uh, center, then there was already a right component. There are plenty of, of uh, you know, Indians who are conservative. They are fiscally conservative. They may not be socially conservative. And I think that's an important point to make. So they may say, I'm a Republican, I'm going to vote Republican. It doesn't mean that they agree with 
everything that the, you know that the Tea Party had to say, but with taxes, with uh, you know smaller government, uh, fiscal policies, uh, they I think they like the conservative uh, more because in India, sadly, I don't know if you know this, but it, India adopted socialism and it almost took the country to bankruptcy. It's only when we got rid of socialism and bought in capitalism that's when it went. In a few decades, it went became now is the fifth largest economy in the world or GDP it's terms. Done very well because with it. Yes. We got rid of socialism slash, you know, almost communism in a way. So we have had our love affair with communism and socialism. It did not work for us. I think we don't want that for this country. So these uh, far left um, center, uh, you know, policies uh, are not very attractive to us because I think we've seen firsthand the effects of it in our own country. And it becomes very fascist in a way. And, and we're seeing elements of that, you know, the, the free speech is clamped down and uh, this whole identity politics thing goes to another level and then the hypocrisy sets in too. Uh, but, but back to your question, you asked me how they view it. I think there's a section who like the administration very much. Uh, also, you have to understand that this is the first president who made, uh, he cut um, funding to sort of rogue states who were harboring terrorism. And uh, sadly, I think under Obama, this funding was enormous. You know, uh, people, you know, most Americans don't know this, which is a shame. They don't know, uh, you know, foreign policy under Obama was atrocious. It really, really, is, you know, we're seeing some of the problems today. But uh, so cutting funding to rogue states that train and harbor terrorists, for example, that's news to us. That's I mean, that's pleasant music to us, you know, so we are happy with that. You know, he's he I mean, there, there are a few things that he has specifically done that uh, I think he's very smart. He knows how to win the uh, win the hearts, I think, of specific groups. And it's like he's reading off of the script, but the script is written by somebody who knows what they're talking about. So, um, you know, I don't know if you I, know this. But I don't think he does very well reading off scripts. <laughs> no, no, no. But what I'm saying he is the script itself. does not do very itself, well with that move. No, but the yes. script itself hits all the points. So even if oh, he's yeah. blabbering Absolutely. it. He's yes. picking all the things, you know. So, you know, the uh, he, 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 he visited India this year. Huge event. It was the biggest reception of his life. Ironically, he got it in India. And I was listening to the speech and I thought, geez, some person from the Indian government wrote the speech that he spoke. Uh, but it was like, boom, 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 boom. Everything that was sentimental to us that we cared about as a people he touched everything and people went berserk, you know, because Indians are very emotional people. And I think we've had a situation where people have tried to, um, you know, uh, they've smear, you know, there's a lot of smearing that's been going on when you criticize a government's actions. It's like you're taking a, a stab at us, right? So this guy is like going on about all these things. It really hit a good nerve, I, I must say. Um, so okay. it's divided. I think that's your answer. But but more people are fed up because they question if, you know, if, if the, I think a lot of Indians are very fearful that if the DNC comes into power, they question the, the US foreign policy, especially if it was India, because uh, they are, they've been very critical of things that they know nothing about and the statements didn't make sense. So that very quickly becomes policy. And we don't want that, we, we've done right. enough uh, good, good, uh, goodwill to change that, you know. So we don't want to go back to square one, in a way. Understandable. Um, so, a question I have, um, you know, obviously, uh, one thing I think you can say that is is pretty uh, standard about Americans is is we don't do enough to educate ourselves about the rest of the world. Um, we are very, uh, very American centric, I guess. If if there is, you know, based on your time you know, here in the States, is, is there one big misconception that you feel Americans have about India that um, if, if you could say, listen, if you listen to me about one thing, this is this is this is the the item that I think Americans get wrong across the board about India. I think they get a lot of things wrong, but I think people who you know don't have passports never read up. I don't think they realize what a hip, dynamic, modern, um, future thinking place India is. It's fascinating. It's very exciting. Um, in fact, 
I would say America is boring in many ways. When you, I go to India a lot. I travel. I've been to a hundred countries. I travel a lot every year. I was in India three times this year. The energy is incredible, and because they know, and so the median population of India is twenty six. It is the youngest country in the world in terms of. It has the youngest. It has the largest youngest population. And you look at America; it's aging. Uh, China is even more aging. Japan is old, you know. So India is this baby. A lot of young, excited, hip people. You know, we also have the second largest English-speaking population in the world. These people are tech savvy. It is. It really is very tech savvy. And young people are. I mean, everyone, even in the village, they may not have running water, but they have a smartphone. Believe you me. And very boom, boom, boom. I mean, the Indian elections. I, I wish people knew more about it. It's one billion people voting, and the results are collated in under an hour. I think. I mean, it's all digital. It's, it's electronic. There is no glitches there. It cannot be hacked. And I look at the election problems that you guys have had. You know, with the hanging chat and all of that. And I think, guys, come on. This is not the cavemen anymore. You have to. Uh, get tech savvy already. I mean, come on. You know, there's a better way to. Uh, your election system, I think, is very flawed, and I think it needs a major reform. But uh, I think uh, Americans could, uh, if they learned about how sort of tech savvy and young hip uh, I India was, uh, and it it's very modern too. We have, you know, some of the most amazing. Um, complexes and so on and obviously the best five star hotels in the world nobody does hospitality or luxury like india if you've ever been you you would you would know so, I, work, uh, and I work in they the hotel think about it like it, they may think it's some sort of a, a developing country or and no they, trust me you have more billionaires there than in, a lot of countries put together there's a lot of wealth there trust me and the the level of poverty is is very uh, reduced. In fact, I think five to ten years it will be eradicated. So you're talking about, uh, you know, a very nice situation that it finds itself in. So I wish more Americans knew that it was actually such a fabulous, cool place. Uh, rather, it's, than it's one of the reasons you're here. It's one yes. of the reasons you're here. We want to help educate our listeners. While, yes. while I have you, um, how has the uh, the country of India been impacted by the coronavirus? How have they handled the pandemic? Very well, I must say. Um, for so 1.4 billion almost, and I think the number of deaths are less than it, I think 40,000. So I think it's about 55,000. Yeah, uh, right now they're up to about 55. Yeah, the, the, the deaths, you know, so that's still yeah. minuscule compared to the 1.4 billion. Like, I know, uh, look at America. I mean, come on, you know, it's like the numbers are atrocious. Don't hold us accountable for that. Yeah, That's, no, no, but I'm just hold saying, us. We're, and it's not we're just, a disaster. I mean, look, by the way, China, I think the numbers are very high there. Nobody is talking about it. So there's a, you know, I think it's done very well because for a few reasons. I'll give you three top reasons. One, the country actually went under lockdown ASAP immediately. At the, it was one of the few countries that completely shut off its borders. The lockdown over there was an actual lockdown where there weren't people roaming around and stuff. Uh, it actually worked. And uh, m there were some religious congregations at the very early days, and they actually did a lot of the spreading. So 70% of the cases apparently are only in a few cities, and it came because of these religious congregations, which, you know, I... I'm shocked that they were even allowed, that they even did that, and they did it intentionally. So that's awful that they did that. Uh, I think the weather helped, the diet helped. You know, Ayurveda is very much a part of our, our life, and I'm shocked that no leader is, uh, other than Modi, no leader was talking about immunity, uh, being natural, being, uh, you know, uh, working out, doing simple things, uh, and having antibody, like, you know, uh, things that increase immunity and meditation, all those amazing things that one can do that don't cost anything, that can actually keep you in good shape. So it's very much in our DNA, I think. So we had that, uh, the heat helped, I think the, the climate really helped. And I think the, the community, I think one thing India is very good at is for the sake of the country, uh, they will come together and do what's necessary, even if it hurts them, which you, nobody complained. People are not complaining other than the trolls online, you know. Right, so, right. 
which here everybody is individual. They're like, no, 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 my rights, my this, my that. And there is no collective, you know, I always say when people say things like America is the greatest country in the world, I, to me as an Indian, it's laughable because they have no civilization to speak of. It's barely two, three, four hundred years old. Try comparing that with something that's six thousand years and intact with its culture uh, thriving, you know, the big difference, right? I mean, we're very, we don't talk much about it, but that's the reality. So well, it, it's very interesting. We have a, a culture of its own. A lot of our culture is, is appropriated from the other cultures that came here. Uh, I think maybe gender reveal parties are unique to the U.S. I don't think any other country would want to uh, to claim those. But uh, but yeah, it's and and again to your point, you know, we we have talked often on this show about you know the social contract and how years ago in America people did things not necessarily because they benefited themselves, but they benefited the community as a whole, or they benefited uh, someone that needed help. And we, we have definitely gotten away from that in this country uh, in the last you know, five, 10 years. And it's very sad to see. I you know, definitely have to say that. You know, I'm also very surprised that, you know, Americans are, are famous for uh, being individualistic and being this rebel, the rebel without a cause in the world. Where's the resistance? Everyone is falling straight into line and things are just like, I just, I'd like to see, um, you know, more people even having conversations like something's not right. The numbers don't make sense. Uh, how long is this going to go on? Let, you know, they're, you, you, they, they're happy to protest without masks about other things, but where is the big protest against the global shutdown? Which by the way, will kill more people in the end than the pandemic itself, because I think the economic um, aftermath of this will be felt long and hard. I'm predicting a recession. It is not looking pretty. Um, it's already slashed, like uh, this second quarter apparently is the worst quarter in US history. Mm -hmm. It's not good news, you know, and we, I think the, these are uh, the better days. I think the worst days are ahead of us right, when we have to do the cleanup for all of this. So uh, where is that that sort of questioning spirit or uh, put your foot down and, and hold not just your government accountable, but hold all parties, all politicians, all city councils. I think this is a country where we've seen the states have a lot of power and yeah. more than this, you know, this is not, it, I don't think that's such a good idea. Um, we're seeing the flip side of it where you're seeing all sorts of things happen. So I'd like to see uh, Americans having honest conversations about their place in the world, uh, about, uh, you know, their own governance, uh, what's going on in the country, what needs to be fixed, because I don't think this is going. And also they're not uh, realizing the, the reason why all of this happened was, one, we were all so entrenched in the global supply chains, right? So you have to make sure that that doesn't happen. We are so over dependent on, on, on one country for our um, imports and the global supply chain that when it's like a domino effect. And I don't think Americans realize a global economy, how economies work, how international governments and courts work. It's a, you'd be surprised, you, 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 you're, you're all really getting screwed here and you can't actually legally do anything about it. So well, hopefully uh, this will, uh, hopefully time for a lot of contemplation. <laughs> yes, hopefully this will drive, uh, especially the younger uh, younger generation, to, to learn a bit more about the world and its impact on themselves. Uh, well, we definitely uh, appreciate you joining us here tonight. Uh, talk to us a little bit. You have a, a new book coming out later this year, New Feminism. Uh, give, give yourself a quick plug for that. Yes. I mean, this is interesting because uh, uh, so, you know, uh, feminism has morphed from it used to be about rights and, and parity and equality. And now it's, I don't know if what your opinion on this is, but it, it has morphed into something else. There are certain, uh, the, the extreme ends of it are, I think, very unpalatable for most women even, uh, to, the, to a point where I think 93% of women around the world don't consider themselves a feminist. So feminist, feminism has become a dirty word. And while it's very important to, uh, uh, you know, strive for, uh, you know, equality and, 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 and meritocracy and all that good stuff and, and equal opportunity, of course. But uh, you, you can't become this, um, like the guy, the man is not the enemy, you know, like this, there's a lot of toxicity, I think. And I think the feminist movement 
has been hijacked, quite frankly, by various unsavory elements, um, including political movements and so on. And they're using it as a tool for, for their own gain. And the, the movement itself, I think, is suffering. And I think it's become becoming something that people can't recognize. And if you don't stop it, uh, it's like a, a, a train that's going to go off a cliff. I see this everywhere around the world, by the way. It's not just America. Uh, you, you're seeing uh, a, a world where uh, when the woman, are, she wants to be like the guy and replace him. And now there is a movement where the guys don't want anything to do with it. This is just too much work, you know. Um, so I, I actually want to look at feminism globally and see the different frameworks that are available. And I don't think that the American model works. So I think it's time to see uh, other frameworks that work. Uh, I particularly am specifically looking at the East because they've had this for thousands of years. And, and despite social issues, uh, the framework itself is intact. You know, I mean, uh, you know, we, we are a culture uh, that upholds the woman and uh, she is not third grade and second class citizen or anything like that. And when you look at sort of monotheistic religions, you know, the woman is really degraded. Whereas you look at uh, sort of karmic fates or, you know, uh, you know these, uh, some of these other um, Eastern philosophies, the woman is the goddess, you know, she's up, upheld, she's elevated, she's uh, celebrated, you know. So the, the whole the goddess worship notion is a beautiful thing. And you're supposed to see every woman as the, the divine and the goddess. So it's a look at inter, you know, feminism from an international perspective, looking at international framework, seeing what's working, what's not. It, I'm a, I write about geopolitics and uh, religion and much more uh, gory issues like that. This is a very light subject for me in a way, but I thought it was important because it's a hot topic. And I thought you need a, a woman, um, uh, and you, you don't want some white guy writing a book like this, right? Because they would butcher him even if he was making all the right points. Right. So I think he wants an, a, a diverse voice and an authentic one. So, yeah. All right. Well, that again is uh, New Feminism coming out later this year. Again, uh, if you uh, want to hear more from uh, Preeti Upala, uh, she has her uh, Eternal Hour on iHeartRadio and her YouTube channel, The Preeti Experience. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we do thank you. like getting uh, different viewpoints, and, and I think we got that today, and I think our listeners uh, very much appreciated that. So thank you for joining us, and hopefully we can have you back on at some point. Thank you. I just wanted to end with by saying that no matter who wins, uh, the oldest democracy in the world and the largest democracy in the world ought to work together because I think this is the most important strategic alliance of the next half century. That's a fact. So I hope the right person wins and I hope that the, the two countries come more closer and work together for a better world. So thank you for having me. It's an honor and uh, hope to be back. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. Care. Stay thank safe. You. Bye now. All right, Brian. Uh, so thanks again to Preeti for joining us. Uh, we did have to uh, postpone Beef of the Week. So uh, let's get that rolling right now. Ron and Brian, Beef of the Week. So Brian, real quick, if I can start um, with my beef this week, and my beef is uh, LinkedIn, but uh, and and LinkedIn, I, I hate LinkedIn. I don't know why. It's 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 really probably one of the most horrible uh, social media uh, platforms. It's such a bizarre there. thing to hate. It's such a bizarre <laughs> fucking thing to hate. But I you and again, I'm sure anyone who is on LinkedIn. Um, no, is this you get very random requests you get very random people coming at you but i got a first this week i got a random uh connection request and then someone sent me a voice message through the linkedin uh app hello it's jason thanks for connecting with me on linkedin hey if you're open i'd love to chat with you for a few minutes over the phone to see if we can gain from the connection especially uh during these times the best number to reach me at is 305. Either way, have a great week. Hope to talk with you soon. Bye now. Why wouldn't you? Why did you edit out his phone number? <laughs> Are you fucking serious? I would have called him right now. <laughs> I'll send it to you uh, privately. But like that to me is even worse than a. It's an a, elevated. A, yeah, 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 it, yeah. It's an elevated. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A template email 
but he has done it in in verbal. And so now, I mean, again, probably little chance that I would have responded to his email uh, previously. I'm clearly not going to respond to this message. So, uh, what I find what I find the most annoying about LinkedIn now is that it has turned into a swimming pool of salespeople. Yes, like, yeah, no like when I joined LinkedIn years ago, or, or you know, uh, you know, uh, two weeks. Um, it really was to make connections with people in my industry of work. And what I now see with the um, connections I'm making is that they are all um, trying to sell me a service. You know, it's, it's, it's no longer about making a, you know, a connection or sharing common ideas, but it's, hey, I've got this uh, software that I'd like to, uh, your, yeah. I think your company would really benefit from, from, from using. Give me a call at 310. Well, and, and, and the other one I love, so I have the, I have the one hotel company that I'm still working for. And, and don't this, say that, don't say that on the podcast. You do know what want the state of Pennsylvania unemployment <laughs> department. They're aware, hear. they're aware of it. They're aware of it. Um, but so the, the message I get so many times is, Hey, big fan of what your company is doing. It's like, really? Because right. you seem to follow the company. You don't follow any of our hotels and you don't follow right. any of the employees of the company. But you're going to tell me you're a big fan of all the stuff we're doing, which we ain't doing jack shit right now because of the pandemic. So Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brian, what's your beef this week? My beef this week was, was going to be um, uh, the colleges that have recently opened for the fall semester. Okay. And are charging full prices for meal plans oh, when yeah. they are delivering. Uh, it's not even substandard um, food packages, but I mean, they're, they, it, but um, also that uh, uh, the uh, incoming classes are um, not social distancing. They're throwing parties, they're drinking. Um, and now there are uh, spikes at uh, several university campuses throughout this nation. That was going to be my beef of the week. Right now, my beef is people who speak opinions, but state immediately in them that they are speaking facts. Okay. I mean, that's fair, which you it's, get a it lot. Irks, it irks the living shit out of me when someone <laughs> speaks of an opinion and then ends it with, and, and, and that's just a fact. Yeah. Like I was talking to somebody recently who said that I forgot how they phrased it, but they said that the damage from the economic shutdown of the uh, global economy is more damaging than a pandemic that has um, uh, killed hundreds of thousands of people on this planet. And, you know, it was, you know, the, the economy is hurting. So therefore we should allow large uh, groups of people to just be open to death. And then just said, you know, and that's a fact. Like it was an example. I think it was somebody right. at work that said something right. like that. I get um, and it was just it's a, it's this comfort level that people have now that their opinion is simply because you know a, a, another person that I that I know recently said that um, ch that that children don't have the receptors for the coronavirus. <laughs> it, it, it's hard. It's you know, and it's like that's clearly an opinion. It is an opinion. It's 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 not a medical fact at this point. But for someone to be like, well, you know, I mean, we should open up schools for, for, for children because they don't have the receptors. So therefore, and then, you know, you sit there and you're like, well, you know, these, these schools that have recently opened and their kids get, are getting sick, they're testing pot. And it's like, oh, but they're, you know, not that age group. And it just keeps whittling down and down and down and down. Um, we, 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 we've lost the word opinion anymore. Now everyone just speaks facts. Now here, here's something though. Now I need to put this to the test. Uh, Listener Billy says Ron and Brian podcast is the best show on the internet. That's a fact. fact is that four opinion. weeks in a row? Is that four weeks in a row Billy makes the show? He's killing it. He is killing it with the comments, no doubt about it. Um, so, Brian, uh, you wanted me to talk to you about the uh, the DNC going on this week. How much of the yes. DNC have you watched? I have watched not one moment of it. Okay. And I'll tell you why. I've sat there and taken the stance of I will be voting for Joe Biden in November. Right. So, so I, I do uh, not need to be exposed to um, a reminder that I should be voting for Joe Biden. Okay. Um, I, I've so, watched it. I, I get sucked I, into it. 
I really do get sucked into the pomp, the circumstance, the whole nine yards. Um, I will say this, the, the DNC seems to be a bunch of really good uh, conceptual ideas executed very poorly. Like for the amount of money, like, so they were going to do a live convention. And I don't know what the dollar amount is to do a live convention for a full week, but you have to imagine that it is a big chunk of change. So by not doing it live, they've been able to take that money and do it virtually. And it is at times similar to like a high school AV club uh, running the projector in class, like a right. lot of uncomfortable silences. Uh, oh, like last night they went to Nancy Pelosi. So they were playing a bumper, a video bumper for Nancy Pelosi. And uh, so at the end of the video bumper, the audio is still going on, but it starts showing her wherever she was doing her broadcast. So the audio is still going. She starts right. talking over the end of the audio. Oh, now you've snapped. and then you've got other um, things where, you know, there's just gaps in time and, you know, they're pulling people up that are clearly there on like Zoom or whatever, and they're not prepared and they're like, oh, what, what's going on? Um, and then last night, you know, Kamala Harris gives her acceptance speech, great speech. But then like Joe Biden comes out, but then Joe remembers, oh, I've got to socially distance because I don't have my mask on. So then they're like awkwardly standing six feet from each other, like air hugging and and Jill comes out and, and Kamala's husband comes out and it's like, it was, I don't know, uh, but Obama crushed it. I mean, you can say many things about President Obama, a uh, great president, uh, deporter in chief prior to President Trump, uh, implemented the policy to separate families. Again, not all good, not all good. Uh, but the man can deliver a speech without question. Okay. I mean, you. I, I got the impression that you, you at least watched the video of the speech. I did. I, I'll admit, I, I, I did watch Obama. Well, let me rephrase it. I saw the highlights of the Obama speech the next morning, and I remember saying to myself, of all things, I would like to watch that. Okay. Well, I'm glad you did. Um, so speaking of it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can do this without screwing this up, although I probably won't. So we have a comment from one of our listeners on Twitch. This is DarkSage9117. My question is, should the Democratic Party continue to move left and leave behind lifelong Democrats like myself, or should they compromise their ideas and mesh them together with more conservative ideas that they used to have to make sure Democrats like myself are still being heard in a party we once knew? Brian, um, I would, I'd like to hear your take on it first. Oh, I, it's it's. Um, I think you've got a couple dynamics that are all going on at the same time. I mean, one is um, we as a society have become more and more polarized. So both parties are being drawn further away from the center. Um, you know, uh, uh, you, your your question is specifically about the Democratic Party lunging left, while at the same time you're dealing with a Republican Party that is lunging right. Um, I, I don't know right now that the that the moderates are adequately represented uh, in American society, let alone American politics. Um, during this whole Democratic primary season, I remember uh, bemoaning the fact, and that's right, I was bemoaning. Okay. Bemoaning. Um, it was. It felt like progressive hopscotch during the debates, where somebody would make a pro, a, a progressively left comment, and then everybody, uh, all the other uh, uh, candidates, would try to say something that was, you know, further progressive, further, um, you know, from the center, um, as if it was a contest to see who could say the most progressive thing, because that's what's going to take to get a win. Well, lo and behold. The party at the end, when it comes to the primaries, um, ends up with literally a moderate who is slightly being pulled to uh, the left. Uh, the whole idea of Joe Biden being a progressive candidate is ludicrous. The man <laughs> is the man is as is, is, is a, a, a government. Yeah, he is Washington, D.C. at this point in his career. You the and, and I think the idea here, at least with the 2020 election is that Joe Biden is being nominated because he is going to get is going to attract the moderates on the left as well as the right. 
Um, you know, I think one of the big things that, you know, uh, uh, happened in 2016 is the fact that the moderates fled over towards uh, uh, the Trump side of the ballot because they found Hillary um, a, uh, a candidate that they were not comfortable voting for. I think the Democrats have strategized over the past four years how to in- how they can maximize um, the number of votes they get from the moderates. I think that you are, um, you know, the way you describe yourself, you are the type of person that the, the, the Democrats are trying to attract. The problem is, is that the moderates are not a very, they are the true silent majority. Yes, without question. Uh, on both it's, sides. It's the, it, it, is, it is the extremists in, in each party that are the most vocal and seem to be getting the most attention. And, um, but at the end of the day, when people close the, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the ballot booth, um, though we'll all be elect, uh, voting by mail once the second wave kicks in, but heaven forbid it affects our economy. Um, the idea is just the fact that it is, um, that's when people really will eventually vote with their conscience. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm with you there. I, I, you know, I think the if you want to see how Donald Trump has impacted politics, I think you look at the Democratic ticket this year. I don't think the Democratic ticket looks any way, shape, or form the way it does unless they felt they needed to craft a ticket to specifically yeah. cut into um, the Rust Belt state and, and the moderate votes that they lost that, that allowed uh, Hillary to lose in 2016. Correct. Um, yeah, I, listen, I, I think the challenge I have is I think there are uh, thought processes on the far left and thought processes on the far right that shouldn't be uh, politically based. So, for example, universal health care. Everybody has the ability to be taken care of equally. No one should go bankrupt if they have a major medical emergency. Right. Shouldn't be a political topic. Um, LBGTQ rights, you know, who you love, who you want to marry, shouldn't be a political thing. Um, but small government, people should be in favor of small government, like not having to go through a lot of hoops to run a business or, or anything else. So, you know, I, I think what any successful political party will need to do is not leave anybody behind and and Mm -hmm. try and find a way to satisfy as many people as possible with their policies. But kind of as we talked, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, you know, especially on the democratic side, people just want what they want. They want their candidate to fit into the box that they want them to fit. They want the policies to fit into the box that they want to fit. Um, and, and they're not going to take any wavering to, uh, to either side. But, you know, and one thing I will say that, 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 that Preeti brought up, brought up that I will agree with is India, from a voting perspective, crushes the United States. Because if you look at what they do, they have multiple parties, multiple candidates, not just two parties. Right. And, they, and it is very high tech, very quick. Like you're not waiting around to see what happened. You know, by the end of the night, you know what the results are going to be. And yet you look at our two political parties, which are in shambles on both sides. Um, and you look at our voting system, which is antiquated and in shambles. Right. Um, but the problem is, is until we fix our political structure, all of these other situations that really need to be fixed homelessness, health care, hunger, um, you know, you name it, is not going to get touched. And that's, I think, the bigger challenge on both the left and the right is no one wants to be bipartisan anymore. You know, right. it used to be a case of, you know, if you had a Democratic president and let's say Republican Senate, um, you know, Republicans would vote for a good bill even if it was introduced by a Democrat or even if the Democratic president was going to sign off on it because they knew it would benefit their constituents and it would benefit the country. Right. We don't have we have party over country. We don't have country over party. And again, I think that extends back to that social contract we were talking about. Everybody's in it for themselves. Every politician is in it for themselves. Every politician wants to get reelected. And if the way they're going to get reelected is by blocking um, productive legislation just because someone on the other side of the aisle has presented it, then that's what they're going to do. 
But there's also a, such a culture in our uh, political world where um, you are the, 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 the collateral damage that you will face as a politician supporting a bill that is not coming from your side of the fence is paralyzing. You but know, it's, 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 it literally is a very sheepish party vote that you're seeing right now. It is so rare for somebody to break party lines and speak on a subject uh, from their own their own mind and thoughts rather than uh, uh, almost like somebody handing them a piece of paper being, you know, you support this, you don't support that. You support this, you don't support that. The global economy is more important than human life. Like these are the things that it seems to be what's going on. Well, and, and I, I think the biggest example of that is Congress couldn't pass an anti-lynching bill. Correct. Correct. Like, I again, I think you would be hopefully hard pressed to find a majority of people that are like, you know what, we might need lynching at some point in the future. So let's not ban that. Yeah. Like, I you would so. think... That's one of those ones that should be a no-brainer, unless there is a bunch of like fluff attached to it or anything else. Um, but it is, it's, it is, it, it's fucking sad. But you know, one thing I would like to do is, um, do we have time to talk about our sponsor? Uh, oh, we forgot about who is uh, who is sponsoring us this week. I went with a. Uh, there's no way you're going to have a problem with it this week. Okay. No way. I'm happy. Okay. I'm happy to hear it. You're going to get the Brian. Guarantee. Give it to me. Re- okay. We're going with the fine people at Kellogg's. Oh, I like Kellogg's. So are, are we talking like a breakfast uh, option we have here? Let me read, Ron. Okay. Sorry. My, my apologies. Kellogg's. The cereal brands you know and love. Yesterday. Now. Tomorrow. At Kellogg's, we're trying to look for ways to brighten your future from better for you ingredients to labels that encourage a healthier tomorrow. That's why on a constant journey to improve the nutrition of our foods without forgetting, Ron, the things that you love most about us, taste and goodness. In 1930, W.K. Kellogg embraced a simple idea. Why not tell the consumer what's inside the box? What's inside the box? Kellogg was one of the first companies to print nutrition labels on the packaging, and they've been following that tradition today. In 2007, they were among the first companies to use the guideline daily amounts to tell you more about the food's total calories. Fast forward to 2020. We are all facing unprecedented times and are all seeking comfort. And what's more comforting than a great traditional American breakfast of waffles? That's right, Ron. What's better than just regular waffles? Blue Waffles. That's right, kids. Blue Waffles. On sale right now at your local supermarket, Kellogg's Raspberry Blue Waffles. Um, You can get a box of six in the freezer section. Um, If you're not sure what the box looks like, you should definitely Google Blue Waffle. Brian, Brian. Uh, Is it it literally a Blue Waffle? It is indeed a Blue Waffle. What's what's the problem? Have you Googled Blue Waffle before? Ron, why on earth? We all know that waffles are a golden, right. uh, yellowish give, brown. Give me a quick favor here before you continue to read. Just uh, on your computer there, just Google uh, blue waffle. Like, I understand it's like a, a mermaid themed waffle, uh, but blue waffle has another connotation uh, in internet history. What is. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you might like that with your flashlight later. Uh, but I would not recommend, uh, yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, I feel like that's another uh, strikeout. Maybe we need to move on. Brian, talk to me about kids on airplanes this past week. It's not kids that we're having the problem with. It's <laughs> right. specifically, and and I know we're going to have one. I already know that this is a, is going to light up the comment section. Yeah, all right. If Let's not, go. if not here in the group chat on my phone tomorrow morning. Yes. Children on planes, specifically under the age of three, who refuse to wear a mask 
are getting thrown off airplanes because of that refusal to wear a mask. Okay. This week, right. there were two incidents that hit the news. Um, one with Delta, I believe it was, correct? Was it Delta? Uh, one was Delta, and I believe the other was JetBlue. It was JetBlue. The first one that took place, and this is the one that really kind of, uh, uh, you know, hit the social media. It was Southwest. Excuse me. I take okay. it back. Um, Southwest removes a family from a flight after a three-year-old with autism was unable to wear a mask. Apparently, this kid... Um, has some type of sensory issue where he does not like things that are touching his face. Well, he's uh, he's he, autistic. Yeah, but not all people with uh, uh, autism do not like their their face being no, touched. No, but this, uh, but that's his particular, you know, one of his things. Sure. Yes. Um, the point being is the fact that the pa- the family arrive to the airport and are told that by the uh, staff at Southwest Airlines that um, they are following CDC guidelines that state that face coverings must be worn by everyone over the age of two. Unfortunately, when it comes to this family, and I don't believe their name was released out there, but uh, uh, the uh, parents uh, showed the staff a medical note that their doctor had said, which was that the kid does not like a face covered. And the staff at Southwest Air said, we appreciate you giving us this note, but you need to get off this plane. We are not going to be able to take off without you. Right. So here's an instance where a family knew in advance that they were not going to be able to follow CDC guidelines and still decided they were going to get on a plane and fly. Then earlier today, and this story reeks of anti-Semitism, um, a Brooklyn mother with her six children that's right, a Brooklyn mother, six children, were kicked off of a jet blue plane after the toddler, um, a two-year-old daughter in that group, refused to wear a mask. And where, might you ask, were they flying on JetBlue, Ron? I don't know. Where are they flying? Orlando, which means only one thing, Disney World during a <laughs> pandemic. Yay! That's what we need to do is fly to fucking Orlando during a pandemic. So uh, the uh, staff at JetBlue kicked the whole fucking family off of the airline. Um, And what uh, seems to be happening on social media is an outrage towards the airline industry because these kids are um, not being allowed to travel without a mask on. I wanted your take on this issue well i think you have i I think you've got two different situations here um i think as far as the first situation goes you know i think there does need to be uh some better clarification as to how to handle uh individuals that for medical purposes can't wear a mask um because the you know, the, the airlines, and I think Delta was one of the ones that said this, like, uh, you know, it, we, we require masks for anyone two years of age or older. Uh, if you are unable to fly, uh, unable to wear a mask because of a medical condition, well, we will uh, we will definitely welcome you on our flights once the pandemic's over. Yeah. Uh, that's, okay. that's not always, a, you know, it's not always a feasible solution for everybody. Um, so how you know how can we number one how can we help people with legitimate medical reasons to not wear a mask you know how can we get them from point a to point b with also not endangering other people on the flight that's one um you know the situation number one if you've got six kids way too many damn kids sorry you, you're just you're you don't need to repopulate um the, the planet yourself um, you know, a, a vagina is not a clown car. You know, it's, it's, it's way too many kids. Um, and again, I get it. A two-year-old doesn't want to wear a mask. But if if your kid... I don't can, want to wear a mask either. Right. I'm going on it, record. I don't want to wear a mask either. If your kid can wear a mask... And, and again, now she was actually in Florida. She's a Brooklyn mother, but they were already in Florida. They were trying to fly back from Florida. So they managed to keep a mask on the kid to get to Florida, figure out a way to get the mask on. Listen, maybe you have to staple the mask to the kid's face. Or, or, or yep. what about this one? 
cover, put the mask on the child's face, then cover the child in a plastic bag and put a rubber band around the neck area to make a nice seal so the child's not allowed to slide its hands up underneath to take the mask off. Listen, I, I think, uh, you know, two years old, I think overhead compartments will fit most two-year-olds. Maybe that- But they can still the breathe. Show. They can still breathe in the overhead compartments and that but, exhale is going into the uh, cabin way. But on, on, the, on the flip side of it, if you are flying in a plane these days, you have to be comfortable with the uh, enhanced possibility of getting Corona because you're in a cylindric tube that, you know, again, who's to say that somebody with a mask on isn't wiping COVID all over headrests as they walk to the back of the plane. So yeah. if in my mind, it's, it's a lot, it's Russian roulette. If you get on a plane these days, um, See, I put this yeah, in this, I, I think, put, I put this in the similar category of the people that go to um, Costco and Walmart, don't wear a mask. And then when somebody uh, points out to them that they should be wearing a mask, they say that, you know, they have a medical condition that prevents them from wearing a mask. And my comment is, well, then don't go to fucking Walmart. Don't go to Costco. Stay home. If you can't wear a mask and there's a disease that's out there that is requiring people to wear masks then don't fucking go outside. Yeah, and that's why you, I there's think no it, I there's it. no goddamn fucking privilege that says you have to be able to go to Costco. That is your legal right. How many videos have we seen of people being like, I thought I woke up in, in a free country. I can go. To... Listen, that's why I say there's two different things. I, I think the one family maybe legitimately felt they had a medical reason for their kid not to wear a mask. And, and I think there we need to, I don't think we define that. And again, it's because the states are left to determine things by their own. If we had some sort of national policy yes. put in place yes. by the federal government, it would make it easier. But if you're flying from New York to Florida, um, you know, the people in New York may be looking at things in a lot different way than the people in Florida are. So, yeah. I, you know, it, it's tough that way. But again, if you've got a two year old and your argument is, well, she just doesn't want to keep her mask on. Well, all right. Well, then your whole your whole. You know, Fuck out of here. Man, she's Fuck too she out doesn't have of receptors. Here. Get that? But everybody no, I don't I don't know that they don't have the receptors. Dr. Drew said they don't have the receptors. Listen, Brian, it's a fact that they don't have the receptors because I just said it was a fact. All right. Any, anything else for the main Well podcast? done. No, no, no. No, no. That we have to end on that cuz that was well that done. Call back in the business. That was well done. By the way, people um, those of you who are listening right now and are saying, listen, um, we want some spice. We want some, uh, uh, we, we need more laughs. Um, we want things want to get looser. Even longer. We want to hear about the um, disparata. What is diaspora? it? Diaspora. I was close. I knew I was close. You learned it um, this week. There's only one place to find that stuff out right now. And that is over on our After Dark, which you can locate by going to our Patreon page, signing up for a bronze or higher level, um, starting as low as $5 a month, going up all the way. Um, we have a uh, titanium level. level if you want to really be a baller. Yeah, you know, support the show. It helps, uh, you know, uh, we've got people in the live chat right now. Uh, you know, uh, that's not free. That costs money. And how does that happen? Because of our Patreons, the people who sit there and say, listen, times are tough. Um, you know, my uh, my wallet is not as uh, overflowing as it used to be. But you want to know something? Uh, uh, an hour and a half a week, I get to enjoy the Ron and Brian podcast. And I'm going to kick a little bit back to you. We're not wetting our beak on this. We are uh, we're, we're we are looking to cover our we are not costs. even breaking even on this. Correct. To be 100 percent honest. Um. So uh, after this, this is where we're going to go for the Patreons. Um, fucking hell. All right. I don't, I don't know that we need to say anything other than that. Except go to Ron and Brian podcast. If you want to know more about the Fleshlight, 
sign up for the Patreon, go to the After Dark. We're all heading over there right now. We're like a, you know, a group at a, uh, at, at a campsite. Like a carrot. You know, absolutely. We're all, we're all going over to After Dark. It's going to be some fun times. I'm going to take a shot. Um, not of penicillin, but uh, uh, probably some type of uh, whiskey or bourbon because uh, I feel uh, I feel like this uh, three point two alcohol beer didn't do its job, Ronald. Not quite cutting it. All right, we are going to roll on out of here. Thanks everybody for joining us this week. We will be back again next week for our Patreon folks. We will be at uh, the After Dark at nine thirty. So join us there.